We hope you're comfortable with a chalice handy or a candle if you have one, your favorite beverage at hand, should you so desire. Now, since I wear several hats here at Westwood, I will now just switch to my stewardship hat. Stewardship, the job of supervising or taking care of something, such as an organization or property. Almost exactly a year ago, we had to abandon our rainbow people on the sanctuary door, part way up the stewardship ladder. However, thanks to the generous support of our members and friends, they were not forgotten. And we have continued to gather here in Zoom world, providing support to our community and a variety of programs, including these weekly Sunday services. Last week, I showed you the blank ladder with our rainbow people all ready to start their climb. A fitting metaphor for our speaker this week, by the way. So here we are, week two of our stewardship campaign. And as you can see, three out of seven of our rainbow people are up that ladder. In fact, red is kind of in between that rung and almost up to the next one. So how can you help get some of those, uh, those other rainbow people on the ladder? First, visit westwoodunitarian.ca, click on the stewardship button, review the information that's there, reflect on your commitment to our community, then, and here's the really important part that we need everybody to do, complete either the new or update existing pledge form. Even if you're returning and your pledge is the same and whatever, please, please, please complete one of those two forms. Then also complete the time and talent form, one per person. So if you're doing a pledge form, it can be one per pledge unit if you pledge with someone else. But if you're doing the time and talent form, we'd really appreciate if each individual did it so we know what you are interested in for the next year. So those two forms are super important and they're easy and they're right there. And if you have any trouble, just contact us. The contact information is there as well. So thank you so much, everyone. And let's see our rainbow people further up that ladder next week. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, gathered here in the struggle and the power. Tansy, hello, bonjour. My name is Brenda Jackson. I'm your service leader this morning. I was born in the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation and have lived most of my life here in Treaty 6 territory, specifically Edmonton, the place known for millennia as Amiskwichi Waskahigan, a traditional meeting ground and home to many indigenous peoples including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Diné, Anishinaabe, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. You're welcome to name the territory where you are located in the chat. 
I also acknowledge that as a settler and resident here, I am a treaty person. As treaty people, we are partners in the stewardship of the land we all rely on, responsible for the impacts of our choices, responsible to the ancestors who came before us, responsible to future generations of all our people collectively. This morning, we're delighted, delighted to have Dr. T.A. Loeffler as our speaker. T.A. is joining us from St. John's, Newfoundland in Labrador. These Sunday services are a team effort. Many thanks to all who contribute behind the scenes and here today. Today, our principal musician is Rebecca Patterson, whom you just heard in our Hymn for Stewardship Month gathered here with Carrie Day, Jennifer McMillan, Steve Bell, and Sheila Kalorn. Thanks as well to our terrific tech team, Alara Stefania Godet and Bill Lee. Whomever you love, whatever your theology or lack thereof, we invite all people of good faith to join this compassionate free thinking community to rest, grow and serve the world. Welcome, bienvenue, tawal. There is room for you here. I invite you to get your chalice or your candle and bring it forward with me. I'll try and keep mine in the screen. All right. Each week we light our chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist community. I invite you to join me in lighting a candle or a chalice Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Each week during Stewardship Month, we invite one of our members or friends to speak a bit about why Westwood is important in their lives and why they support this community and participate here. This morning, I'm pleased to invite Amelia Denica to join us. All right. Um, hello, I'm Amelia and I use they, them pronouns. I'm coming to you live from Amiskwachee, Swaskahegan, where I'm a settler on the traditional lands of the Papas Chase Cree, about three blocks away from the Westwood building. I started coming to Westwood in the fall of 2018, shortly after I moved to Park Allen. I had seen the building as I was walking in the neighborhood and I was intrigued. I knew that my mom had been involved in Unitarian Universalist youth groups when she was my age. She and my dad were married by a UU minister and they even brought the family to the occasional service at UCE when I was a kid. However, we lived east of Sherwood Park at the time and the long drive deterred us from attending regularly because there was no Zoom service back in the day. Um, I, was, I wasn't old enough at the time to really understand what was going on. So in 2018, I took the opportunity to check out Westwood and see what this univer Unitarian Universalist thing was really all about. It turned out that it was a welcoming space full of people who shared my values and weren't going to tell me what to believe, so I stuck around. To be honest, I didn't always understand what the speakers were talking about, but I enjoyed the singing and the conversations afterward enough to keep attending. I valued the chance to get to know people from different generations and sometimes with different viewpoints from mine, but who were always kind and genuinely wanted to hear what I had to say. Westwood became a major point of stability for me over the next few years as I navigated a long distance relationship, the transition from finishing university to starting work, ending my long-term relationship and starting a new one, and of course the pandemic. Um, I don't often share the details of my personal life with the congregation, but it is helpful for me knowing that whatever is going on in my life, there's always a comforting place I can visit on Sunday morning. And that's why, Westwood is a really important part of my life. Thank you so much, Amelia, for sharing with us this morning. The world is one world, what touches one Wash us round about the clouds 
This week, the world marked the anniversary of the sad beginnings of the global pandemic and remembered the millions who have died. It has been a year filled with sadness and loss. Fortunately, there have been moments of joy as well. We take a few minutes each week to share our joys and concerns in the loving support of community. As we listen to Rebecca, Again, you are all welcome to light a virtual candle by sharing a joy or concern in the chat. I light a first candle for those who have died from COVID-19 and those who continue to suffer physically, emotionally, and economically. As our, as our custom, we light a final candle for those joys and concerns that remain in our hearts. Please join me in the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us mm -hmm. to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. During the offertory, we give thanks for all who support this community, for those who make these weekly services possible, for those who organize and participate in activities throughout the week, for all who are here today, all of you. From you I receive, to you I give. Together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Dr. T.A. Loeffler is a celebrated educator, adventurer, nature advocate, author, 
and professional keynote speaker from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. TA is a professor of outdoor education and recreation in the School of Human Kinetics and Recreation at Memorial University of Newfoundland. In 2020, TA was selected to the Canadian Geographic 90 Greatest Canadian Explorers list. Additionally, in 2015 and 2016 respectively, TA was named to the Canadian Geographic's Canada's Greatest Explorers 100 Modern Day Trailblazers list and Greatest Canadian Modern Women Explorers list. Over the past 15 years, TA has shared her message of big dreams, big goals with over 100,000 youth in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And beyond that, I'm enormously pleased to say TA is my longtime friend. TA was born right here in Edmonton, lived in the same neighborhood as the current Westwood building and even helped out with our Westwood nursery a long time ago. We have many connections. We have shared good times, difficult times, and an incredible Grand Canyon rafting adventure. I'm so happy to introduce my totally amazing friend, T.A. Loeffler. Wow, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can I see a thumbs up? Okay, perfect. Great. Well, um, thank you for this invitation and to, to be here with you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you're joining us here from this morning. Uh, I'm sitting here in uh, beautiful downtown St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, we honor the diverse uh, Indigenous uh, folks that it ha have inhabited many parts of the island on which we live. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the lessons that I've learned from climbing a few peaks around the world and about how um, something that I think is no stranger to Unitarians, but pulling together and getting on the, the same rope. Uh, change the slide, please. So I began my uh, climbing journey with this peak, which is to the northwest of, of those folks uh, who are in the western part of Canada. This is uh, Denali. This is the highest peak in um, the United States and in Alaska. And uh, it was this peak that drew me in initially to uh, begin climbing. And when I first saw it from this distance away, which is about 50 kilometers, I had the thought that it's, and I'd had an idea that I would want to climb it one day, but my first thoughts were it was too high, too far, too cold, too expensive. I just used the word T-O-O -O quite a bit. And one of the things that I have learned is to pay attention to when I say the word T-O-O, because -O, usually what comes afterward is uh, an obstacle or something that I'm seeing or that is actually in my way. Um, could you do a click please? And so when we are, are learning to dream big and we might have dream, big dreams about um, surviving COVID, we might have big dreams about a, a big expedition or making social change. But usually when a big dream comes to us, for me, I've seen that it, and my initial thought is that's impossible. There's no way that can happen. But then there's usually this little glimpse of possibility that I can see that if I can get myself headed in a direction and if I can get with others who can support me in going in that direction, I might be able to make it possible. Uh, change, please. And go ahead and do a double click. So what Denali taught me is that I need to balance my view and manage and, and balance my footsteps. So the view is that vision, it's that goal, it's that long big picture for myself or for others, for our world, for our society. And the footsteps are the actions that, that I take to get myself there. And if I only have the vision and don't take any action, I, I don't get any closer to that. But if I only have the action without the vision, I can use a lot of energy and, and lose focus along the way. So I found really the first step often is to imagine the impossible, to accept the invitation towards whatever I'm being drawn towards. In my case, to make a plan for fundraising, for physical fitness, for mental strength, 
um, I need to create support for that. And when I first started my climbing career, there wasn't any social media. So I basically told 10, one friend and they told 10 friends and it was like the old Fabergé Organics commercial. And suddenly I had an email list of, you know, 300 people that I emailed once a week to kind of keep myself focused and moving ahead. Now it's a little bit easier with many more platforms. And usually what I have found when I'm trying to, to move towards one of my bigger dreams or one of my bigger goals, and I usually have to practice going beyond where I'm comfortable. And you'll notice the red line there on the slide, and that is in um, a metaphor for the rope. And, and my talk today is about getting on the same rope. And I think it's these things when we make the decision to go forth like that, that we'll want to have that connection to ourselves and connection to those that surround us. Next slide, please. So this was my uh, team for climbing that peak. Uh, there was 14 of us to, um, and one of the things that was very interesting is when we began the process and we, were, we weren't using any aircraft, we were actually walking up from the toe of the glacier, is if any one of us you know, lost focus or felt like we couldn't go on or had got sick or something, the entire team would need to turn from the mountain and take that person back to safety, which is fine. I think that's the wonderful way to set out in terms of mountaineering. But we also knew we needed to, that we were about to embark on something very difficult. So we actually took a piece of rope and we all ceremoniously uh, tied a knot in that rope to signify that we would do our best. And that's all we can do in each moment is our best to, um, to ask for help, to do our jobs that we needed to do to make the expedition. In fact, to the, get on the um, same rope together in undertaking this uh, 30 day expedition. So if uh, I could have a click please. So what I found in taking this on is really in some ways the tougher the task and this involved, this expedition was 30 days, 60 to 80 pound packs that we had to carry. Uh, tough snow conditions, 24 hours of daylight that we actually truly needed to depend on each other. And that was a really first deep experience of kind of having to set aside some of my personal will for, uh, for the team. Next slide, please. So here you can see me all decked up. Uh, people often say, TA, are you trying out for the milk, uh, the milk mustache um, commercial? In fact, here, that's a little bit of uh, what I call when I'm speaking to youth, baby butt diaper cream and zinc oxide. And so that's just to protect my lips and my nose from the intense sunlight, because you can see it's a, a quite a, a snowy world. So the sun actually hits you from multiple different directions. And you see I'm, direct, I'm, I'm uh, dressed up with some place to go and I'm tied to my teammates. So when we're climbing on the glacier, we literally tie ourselves together and need to sort out, even though we can't always speak because we could be up to 30 meters apart, how to find a pace that allows us to go together, a pace that I means someone's not being pulled off their feet by a team that's being moved too quickly, or a team that's going too fast where the rope gets slack and then loses its protective ability. And it's a pretty amazing uh, experience to do that for 26 days on the way to the summit, finding a way in myself and with the group to make that work. Because indeed it can be a pretty frustrating experience to kind of get that sorted out. And it's an interesting time because you have to um, continue to motivate yourself when you're kind of in isolation, a little bit like we've lived our last year, that we know there's others there, uh, maybe in the same house or maybe outside the same house, but we have to sort out how to keep taking those footsteps. Next slide, please. So I'd actually spent about 10 uh, months uh, preparing, another click through, please. And then another click through. We climbed for about, as I said, 26 days. You can see one of our tent camps down below the ridge. And another click, please. And we were very lucky to come to the summit all together. And there were two folks that for the last summit day felt really, really poorly, but we were able to lighten their load. We were able to take some of their weight and um, they decided to go with us to the summit. So actually our entire team made it to the summit. That's the Newfoundland and Labrador flag for those of you that uh, might not know. And um, 
it, the few times, and it doesn't happen often, but the few times when an entire team in mountaineering gets to the top, it's such a wonderful celebration because um, <laughs> we're all there and we all got there together on the same rope. Of course, it doesn't happen all that often. Sometimes people have to turn for weather for where we all don't get we all don't get up or someone has to turn because they're not feeling well or they're not feeling up to the task that day. But when we truly all get there, um, it's just such a wonderful cause. But of course, it's only halfway. We have to stay focused. And I know right now in, in the COVID pandemic, there's a lot of COVID fatigue. And it really reminds me of having gotten to the summit and you know you're at least halfway there, but it's hard to stay focused for the down, the down steps. And um, it's actually when more accidents happen is on the way home. So um, please, in this next little while, stay safe, pay attention to your footsteps as you, as you climb back down. Uh, next slide, please. So as I climbed this peak and many others, I realized, and uh, another click through, um, that we have different obstacles and uh, we all might face different obstacles even on the same mountain. And there has been some discussion of late about um, that we are all in the same storm, but of course not in the same boat. And the same can be true on the, on the mountain that based on our, our personal wiring and our life circumstances and that what we live with, uh, what can be a mountain to someone can be a molehill to someone else. So um, one of the things that the being on the mountain has taught me is to bring a lot of compassion for myself and for my teammates as we, we struggle to find a way to go there together. Sometimes we've had to um, trust the snow bridge. You can sort of see a snow bridge there in the middle of the screen. This is a giant crevasse. It fortunately has showed itself to us. Or sometimes we might need to go to the end of the crevasse where it pinches. And sometimes we might need some specialized help. Like on Everest, we um, use the services of the icefall Sherpas who make the route for us to provide those abilities to get over those obstacles. Next slide, please. And as I was alluding to earlier, a lot of times when we're climbing our, our peaks, whatever they might be, we can feel very, very alone. And when I'm climbing on the rope, we have to keep that distance between ourselves and our teammates so that we can keep each other safe. An almost per perfect metaphor right now for, for living in COVID. Um, but we had to, I always had to find myself reminding myself, uh, click through please, that we are also together. And um, besides uh, hanging with Unitarians at some points in my life, I also uh, spent a fair amount of time hanging with Buddhists. And Buddhist thought taught me that we can let go of some dualities. And one of the dualities that I've worked hard to, to drop is that alone and together have to be a duality, that they actually can exist in the same moment. And when I've been on, the, on a rope team on the mountain is when I've had a, a, a lived experience of being both alone and together at the same time. Next slide, please. And another click through, please. So this is our, our view from coming down the mountain. And um, it was an interesting descent as we come up. It took us about eight hours to get to the summit. And when we had to come down, uh, we had this beautiful view that you see here and then the weather started to turn. So we needed to really be careful as we stepped down. And we had one particular teammate who was really, really struggling, falling over his feet, getting caught in the rope. And we needed to come together to sort out how could we get him um, into a state of being so that he could uh, walk down safely. Because in fact, if he wasn't walking down safely, none of us were coming down safely. So we took some weight, we made sure that he got some groceries on board, make sure he was well hydrated, make sure his temperature was okay. And then he, he could go a little bit easier than he had gone before. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I have done in my climbing is tried not to always have it be about where I get to stand. Um, so I've always done some outreach. So I've done outreach in schools. I've actually spoken at my niece and nephew's schools who live in, still live in Edmonton. And what's lovely, of course, is we reach out to youth and when we try to bring others along on our journey, they reach back with inspiration. Next slide, please. So um, these are some of my favorite greeting cards I've received from, from youth over the years. And next click, please. Uh, 
This is probably my favorite. It says, good luck, Ms. T.A. Loeffler. Make sure you wear your safety equipment. And when you open it up, go ahead and click, please. It says, so you won't take an unpleasant trip. <laughs> and this, I think, is what uh, can happen on a mountain, literally, if, if uh, we're not all on the same rope. An interesting fact is that when they analyze mountaineering accidents, they often happen when there is struggle or challenge in the group dynamic. That can lead itself to, um, uh, to conditions where people are paying less, atten less attention to risk management. And so I know the theme for your month this year is cooperation. And in, I think cooperation not only makes, uh, makes the going a little bit easier, but can also help to keep us safer. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, another one of my favorite greetings that says, Dear TA, I hope you get to the top of Mount Everest. I know I couldn't. You have climbed more mountains than anyone I know. I don't know anyone who's climbed a mountain before except you. <laughs> so <laughs> made it very, very easy to, uh, to stand out. But um, I know that I probably would have given up climbing much before had I not known that others were, were pushing through their obstacles and reaching out and asking for help in ways they couldn't before because I was sort of demonstrating that it's, it's okay to do that kind of a thing. Uh, next slide, please. And another click through. There it comes. Oh, there it comes. There we go. So one of the things in mountaineering and in and also in many other kinds of expeditions is the idea that uh, people are glorified for taking an unsupported expedition. And um, you know, they I was reading an article the other day about polar expeditioning, and they wanted to make sure that they had the definitions of what unsupported meant versus you know, no help or this or that. And I realized, in fact, if we sit down and think there probably is no such thing as an unsupported expedition. So next slide, please. So, oh, there's Flat Stanley. Uh, if, uh, he's come with me and then next slide, please. Um, so there's no such thing as an unsupported expedition. So I have made a few goes at, at Mount Everest and um, I'm gonna take you a little bit up the ways of that mountain. But what I did in preparation for thinking about this idea of cooperation, I wanted to think about all the ways in which my expeditions have been supported. So here we are landing at, a, at um, Hillary Tenzing Airport. And so in starting that expedition, I'm supported by the pilots who have flown myself and my teammates to there. I'm supported by the folks that are going to meet us there and carry our equipment. Next slide, please. I'm supported by the air traffic controllers that help the aircraft land uh, safely. I'm supported by the parents of those folks that gave birth to the folks that eventually became the air traffic controllers. Next slide, please. We're dependent on the folks that we hire to help us get to the mountain. And they sometimes carry their loads in these baskets called dokus. So I'm, uh, I'm dependent on the folks that grew the fibers that are used and woven into the dokus that are used by the porters that I hire to help carry my goods. Next slide, please. And I'm supported by the, the folks, most often men, but sometimes women, who carry um, their loads up to the mountain. Next slide, please. And I'm supported by the folks that uh, are supported by the yaks, the, the folks that use yaks as pack animals. And, the, and, I, and I'm definitely dependent on the yaks who there are carrying their, their own food as well as my food to the base of the mountain. Next slide, please. And I'm supported by my teammates and those that make the journey with me. Uh, again, here we're not actually having to walk on a rope or walking into base camp, but this is where I'm building those relationships so that later when the climb gets tougher, and, and sometimes it can even be tough at this stage, I'm climbing, um, we're building those relationships that we can um, use later when we actually truly need to be taking every step in unison. Next slide, please. As we climb towards base camp, we, we pay uh, respect and uh, homage to those who've made the journey before us, who set the track, who set the way that build the route, and unfortunately, who may have suffered um, an injury or death on the way. Next slide, please. 
And next slide, please. As we travel, we also, um, much as you did in the uh, land acknowledgement, we also pay our respects to those uh, folks that whose land we pass through and to the traditions. So here we are lighting a, a butter lamp asking for protection for ourselves and our teammates and our climbing staff on the mountain and also protection for ourselves and our families back home that we've left to climb. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. When we arrive, we see the entire big mountain. And one of the things that I know is true when I'm setting out on a big journey and I'm sitting with a deep, big teammate, when we look at the entire big mountain, that's when those twos come out. Um, that it just seems so big and so difficult to make whatever changes I need to make or, or to, make, uh, to make way up such a giant mountain. Mount Everest is the one there on the left. Uh, Lhotse, the fourth highest peak in the world, is back there in the middle, and you see the, the Kumbu Glacier coming through between. Next slide, please. And when we live at base camp, we have to learn how to um, coexist in a very challenging environment. Uh, your camp is moving downhill each day. <laughs> it creaks, it groans, gaps open that threaten to swallow your, your tent. It can be challenging even to go for a walk. So we begin that process here, even at the base of creating those connections that we'll be able to more rely on as we go forth. Next slide, please. And we look up at one of our biggest obstacles, the Kumbu icefall there. It's, uh, I like to say it's like 10,000 icebergs sprinkled down from a height of about 1,000 meters. And we stare up at it and wonder, should, will we ever be able to traverse that safely? Next slide, please. We do a puja ceremony to respect the traditions of the Sherpa uh, people that we climb with and also to ask the mountains permission to climb. And it also, I think for me, provides that moment of focus to sort of set my intention to climb um, with compassion for myself and with my teammates and to, to climb in the best ways that I can. Next slide, please. So once the, the, the prayer pole with the prayer flags is lifted, next slide, please. And once our teammates uh, and climbing folk, climbing Sherpas are ready, we begin the climb. Next slide, please. I've always been quite taken by um, the prayer flags. They're also known as Lungta. And on the prayers are prayers for um, good health, for compassion. The different colors represent the different wisdom energies. And when the wind blows, those prayers are released for all. So when they are uh, praying or setting intentions, they're saying it not only for the, um, ourselves, but also for the entire world. And I love that when we leave in the morning to do the climb, we again stop, uh, light some juniper and set that intention for safe return. Next slide, please. When we get into the ice fall, it's a horrible, beautiful place. Beautiful because the colors of the of the the ice is gorgeous, but just knowing how treacherous it is that treacherous that with this falling ice can be. Next slide, please. And being in such a big place is really um, educative. To quote one of my favorite educational philosophers, uh, John Dewey, in helping me remember how small I am in such a large world, and reminding me always to stay humble. So you can see the climbers next uh, click, please. It will probably help out there to find them there in the mass of ice. And going through the ice fall um, the first time is often terrifying because it's very difficult to breathe. You're finding the route for the first time. You've not been there, at least in a season. The Sherpas have done their best job to set the trail, to put the rope in. Um, but it is such a struggle to get through the first time when you're not acclimatized. Next slide, please. And of course, we have to cross those ladders. So again, thinking about all of the support that I've received to be on the mountain. Again, I, I have the support of the folks that mined the minerals that went into the that went into the ladder and got the fabrics that got woven into those uh, ropes, the carabiner manufacturers, and then of course, the folks that took them through facing the danger of the icefall to put the ladders into place. Next click, please. And it can be pretty uh, intense to step over those big openings. Um, and what teammates tend to do is spread those guidelines, next slide please, uh, for each other to make the passage over those scariest parts more easy. 
because you can see that there can be some slack in those lines. Next slide, please. And you can see there we're passing through a, a piece of the ice fall and you'll notice that almost every single one of these slides has a piece of rope in it. And that rope is uh, tying us not only to our teammates, to the wonderful staff that has placed it there, but it's placing it to everyone we've ever been connected to as we take every single step. I knew as I climbed the mountain, I was in the footsteps of Junko Tabai, the, the first woman to climb Mount Everest and everyone else who'd followed in, in her steps, as well as many of the folks who've uh, soared, the, the, the animals, the crows, the gorex that have soared over the top. Next slide, please. The ladders, they go vertically as well as horizontally. Next slide, please. And as we get into the to the coom, things relax a little bit in terms of the, the verticality, but it can still be very challenging. Here at six thousand meters, it takes uh, four um, takes sorry two steps to take every breath. As we go higher, it can take four steps to take every breath. As one of my teammates near the summit, it took him ten breaths to take every step. And when we're on these big in these big moments, it can feel like we're not sure we can hold on, that we don't have the patience to get through. I often kind of come back to remembering that if I breathe, I bring in that sense of, of energy and vitality and I can make sometimes that panic and that moment go and I can continue to climb. Next slide, please. We make our way up to camp one. Next slide through a bunch of uh, crevasses, a bunch more of those obstacles. Next slide, please. And on to uh, camp two, where we spend a lot of time acclimatizing because we don't just go up the mountain once, we have to go up and come back down and go back up more acclimatized and then come back down. And sometimes I dread the second climb uh, through a, a, a section much more than the first because I know it, how difficult it might be. But usually once I get going on the second one, I take that experience and those that knowing that I know some of the landmarks along the way and I use that to help focus and, and quell that sense of, I don't know if, if I can do this. Next slide, please. So then we face the Lhotse, uh, the face, the very giant ice wall. Next slide, please. And the route is gonna zip up through there. Next slide, please. Climbing the Lhotse face is one of the most intense pieces of the climb because it's hard glacier ice, it's very vertical, and you're climbing from 6,500 meters to 7,500 meters. So here definitely, again, we're dependent on all the folks that made our, our going quite possible. Next step. And we're dependent on those that have carried the tents and, and tied them to the edge of the mountain. And once we've reached camp three and had a, a sleep here, then we head all the way back down to base camp. Next slide, please. And we make our way down through all of those parts. Next slide, please. And I like to say that the summit is when 10,000 hours of training meet moments of luck and also um, meet a team that makes sense to climb with. I've left several mountains when that team wasn't coalescing when I didn't feel safe in that team. So a big piece of that luck to me is who has gathered, who has come together, who has committed themselves to getting on the rope with me? Do I trust them? Can I make my way with them? Next slide, please. Unfortunately for me, I'm on Everest. I haven't yet met the summit. I haven't climbed as high as I've wished. I've met uh, some protozoans and some various bacteria along the way. Next slide, please. So I've had to make the very difficult decision, the very disappointing decision, the very right decision, the very safe decision to come back down uh, to, and live to climb another day. I wasn't ever willing to, um, unless you know, tragic accident struck, to push beyond what made sense. Next slide, please. So headed back to the Lukla airport, all back into that, that, that cir circuit of care to get me back off the mountain. Next slide, please and into the loving friends of friends and family who welcomed me back um, and nursed me back to health after that. Next slide, please. That might need a second click. There it comes. <laughs> so even though I haven't always gotten to climb as high as I've wanted, I've had lessons from the mountain that I'd like to share with you today to, to, to close. So next slide, please. 
Ideally, that we prepare for the worst together and celebrate the best. You'll see those snow walls around the tents. We build them whether the weather is good or whether we expect the weather to be foul. So when we build those protective, that protective community around ourselves, we know that we can depend on it no matter what the weather. Next slide. We need to see the way forward together. So we continue to need to set that view that I talked about that we balance with the footsteps. Next slide, please. We also need to appreciate how far we've come. You can see those same tents there in the background, those four little dots. And I often like to say, when you're sitting in the bowl of oatmeal, you can't tell that you've had a bite. So we need to appreciate that we have skills today and knowledge today and the ability to get on the rope today together that we didn't have last week or last year. Next slide, please. We need to risk disappointment together. I knew in, in trying to climb Mount Everest that I had a 25% or a one in four chance of actually getting to the top. So I wisely didn't necessarily make it about getting to the top, but I was wickedly, as we would say here in St. John's, wickedly disappointed the first time and the second time and the third time. But if I hadn't risked that disappointment, I would have left so much behind. So I, I invite us to risk disappointment, to take those steps we need to take. Next slide, please. We can aim high together and set the intention to, to do the best we can together. Next slide, please. And we can face our avalanches of doubt together. I like to say that um, when, fortunately I've never had a real close call on a, on an actual um, avalanche. This one I knew we were quite safe from, but that I used to get, I used to run away. And, and, and Brenda said we had a long history and Brenda, this will make Brenda laugh because she knows that when I was a student at the U of A, when things got tough, I changed majors as an undergrad. Um, and it ended, it ended up being seven changes because when the doubt came, I ran. Uh, one of the things that my Buddhist practice has taught me is to stay, to stay steady, to keep my seat when that doubt comes. And in fact, I did eventually finish my bachelor's degree and a few others. I think you may need to click through there for me. Uh, so the avalanche will progress. There it goes. And one more click. Perfect. And one more click. And as I said, when we look at the whole big mountain, it often just looks so overwhelming. But if we can come up with one very next step, and can we take that step together with the support of those around us and who are on the same rope, it can become much more manageable. Sometimes on some mountain, I have to pick a spot that's three steps from me and just take everything within me to get to that spot and then take another spot. Sometimes I'll say, okay, five steps and I'll pull up on three. Sometimes I'll say five steps and I get 10, but let's figure out how to take that next step. Next slide, please. We have to embrace hard work and that hard work could be mental, it could be spiritual, it could be physical, it could be anything. But when we embrace the hard work that we need to do in moving towards our, our big dreams and our big goals. Next slide, please. The view that we have of ourselves, of our mountain, of the rope that you can see there changes. Next slide, please. So that when we get all on the same rope, and next slide, please, or next click, please. Um, then if we come together and our actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, then we can be leaders. And we might be leaders in our, in our home lives, in our church lives or our religious society lives, in the arts, in society, in working for social justice, whatever we're called for to work forth, when we take that on, those around us and those on the same rope as ourselves will move the world forward. And thank you very much for your kind attention this morning. Thank you so much for being here with us, TA, and sharing your wisdom and experiences. We're all enriched by it. And it's interesting that your final quote was from John Quincy Adams, a Unitarian president of the United States. <laughs> now we invite you to sing along with Rebecca for our closing song.
Now, as we come to the time to extinguish our, our chalices, may we remember that love is the spirit of this congregation. May the songs we sing celebrate this love. May the lives we lead embody this spirit. May you all go forth in peace. Blessed be. Next week, if you can make it back with us, we have the fabulous, incredible Liz James coming for in from Saskatoon. Many of you will know Liz from previous appearances at Westwood or from the Unitarian Universalist Hysterical Society, which is very active, and from the Cracked Cup uh, podcast which is going on. So Liz is a, a great speaker and we're looking forward to having her next week. 